online, decentralized and networked. Digital communications technologies have thrust the calculus of the old media power structures. They have disrupted the multipolar media landscape and ushered in today's heteropolar global mediascape. Tracing the contours of heteropolarity and its implications for the relationship between conflict and media reveals two major developments. On the one hand, entirely new media poles are forming, whilst on the other hand, old media poles are evolving. Each of these two developments have impacted on the mediatization of war. The first development, i.e. the formation of entirely new types of media actors, has afforded a broad range of non-state actors to become directly involved in the mediatization of conflict. So what we are seeing are people reporting about war who are completely outside the control of the military. They're civilians. They're people on the other side of the conflict. They're people who are caught up in the conflict, but who aren't traditional media representatives or part of the military establishment. And that's created a whole new voice. You've also now got this 360 degree battle occurring on multiple fronts in multiple countries, uh, on the streets of Tehran, you know, in, in Mexico City, in Israel, uh, even in the streets of New York City. And so the concept of what a journalist is changes dramatically when if you happen to be at a spot where a terrorist attack occurs, you're now a citizen journalist. If you have a cell phone, you can take video of that. You know, when Nada died in Iran during the protests, here's this young girl dying, you know, essentially on the streets of Tehran. No one would have known that story except there was a cell phone that was able to record that video and posted it, and all of a sudden the whole world knew her story. That was an incredible example of how the power of new media has put the ability to communicate with millions of people in the hands of everyone who owns a cell phone. So, because of the digital new media, you have new actors that in a sense become super empowered actors. An early example are the Zapatistas, one of the first groups to successfully employ the internet as a means to rally global political support for their cause alongside the military struggle against the Mexican government. Other, more recent examples of this development can be found in terrorist organizations like Al-Qaeda, Jamal Islamia, or the Islamic State using various digital new media platforms to debate and refine their strategies, to recruit sympathizers into their ranks, and to visually counter their enemies' media campaigns. Yet they can also be found amongst the protesters in Iran, Thailand, Burma, Tunisia, Egypt or Libya, who have rallied support and organized themselves against their governments for Twitter and Facebook. Citizen journalists, from the famous Baghdad blogger or the Occupy Wall Street movement to Anonymous and the Syrian citizens, they all have been able to directly lend their voices to the mediatization of today's conflicts. Other digital platforms, such as Wikileaks, have demonstrated the potentials of whistleblowing in a digitally wired world. Humanitarian NGOs like SaveDafur.org have teamed up with Google and Facebook to visually map and bring to the public's attention the mass atrocities and genocide in Darfur. US soldiers placed images of the abuses in Abu Ghraib onto their personal websites, thereby triggering a global media outrage. All these actors can have a view, can have an image, and it can express a perspective outside traditional media outlets. At the same time, digital new media have also allowed states and conventional militaries to become direct media producers providing them a news presence independent of the traditional media gateways. For instance, the Israeli army banned all foreign media from its 2008 military campaign in Lebanon and instead conducted its entire media campaign, including press conferences through social media sites. During the Iraq war, the Pentagon set up its own YouTube channels, and in response to the Abu Ghraib scandal, introduced Millblogs, a platform for which media-trained US soldiers report their war experiences to a general public. 
the Syrian and Iranian regimes successfully used Facebook and Twitter as surveillance tools to identify and subsequently arrest protesters. Furthermore, the Pentagon has developed free online first-person shooter games like America's Army as a way to successfully recruit young men and women into military service. Far from being an exhaustive list, these examples allow for a small illustration of how digital new media technology has afforded the formation of entirely new media actors. New media actors who can directly generate and disseminate news without having to go through established traditional media filters. Yet, alongside these new media poles forming, old media poles are evolving at the same time. Digital new media technology, in other words, has not left traditional media outlets unaffected. Besides triggering significant budget crises amongst old media platforms, including ever-growing numbers of outright foreclosures, especially in the newspaper sector, traditional media have evolved by incorporating and drawing on digital new media tools and sources. Here, traditional media now draws on footage taken off the internet, be this in its coverage of the war in Syria, the Iranian protests in 2009, or the political crisis in Thailand. And TV channels directly include online video statements from their viewers into prominent shows like Al Jazeera's flagship program, The Listening Post. The impact of this dual development of new media forming and old media evolving has been to fragment the mediatization of conflict. It has made it very hard for parties to a conflict to generate a uniform perspective, to present media audiences with a monological view of the truth. In short, it has splintered war reporting due to the wide range of new voices that have been introduced into the mediatization of war. This development has started to transform the experience of war, for it allows for the production of competing virtual realities. The one-sided media spectacle of war has been replaced by wars of spectacles. This is why, for the first time, we are witnessing true media wars, or what Paul Virilio calls cybernetic wars of persuasion and dissuasion. Wars where the primary strategic objectives are no longer exclusively the elimination of the enemy's military forces, but also the shaping and reshaping of public opinion. With state and non-state actors both vying for hearts and minds, today's transformed global media sphere has become an important, even decisive conduit and arena in warfare. As a result, some of the most critical battles in today's wars have not only been fought in the mountains of Afghanistan, in the Libyan deserts, in the streets of Baghdad or in the urban center of Aleppo, but also in and through a range of different media platforms. This means that while states until very recently were able to expose their citizens to a one-sided and highly sanitized representation of war, they now find themselves waging an unprecedented virtual war alongside the physical, real wars on the ground. The heteropolar media landscape, in other words, has become a medium of contemporary war.